being Zeeland, where New Zealand is, is named after. Oh, wow. And its uh, weapon and credo, its slogan is Latin, Luctor et emergo. And that means something like, I struggle and I will rise. So, <laughs> <laughs> kind of the, the phoenix. Sorry? The phoenix. Uh... Exactly, yeah, yeah. And it reminds me of a beautiful poem of uh, Maya Angelou, your countryman. American. Yeah, we rise. Very famous. Or, uh, very, yeah, and, and still we rise is the like repeat. Exactly. Line That's a beautiful yeah. one. It's, it's a very, very famous poem. Very, rep very representative of uh, the underrepresented uh, law classes and disadvantaged classes of America. My Angela exactly. is a perfect example of this. I love she exactly. Was mistreated yeah. as a black woman in the poor South of America. I, I, uh, and and it's about being proud and uh, in, in a good way. I, I think I posted it once in the random channel, but I can repost it as well as an inspiration because it's it's very much also related to uh, yeah emergence of of the new, the one to be heard and seen and manifest itself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Maya Angelou. So much wisdom out there already. <laughs> yeah, that that's true. Sometimes and, uh, I feel there there is too much wisdom to even absorb in in our oh, yeah, lifetime. It's, it's it's something that I'm aware of very much of. It's like I am always chasing new interesting things to learn from, but I just can't learn it all fast that. enough. Too much there's too much good stuff out there. There's also lots of philanderers of uh, purveyors of questionable quality. So, yeah. but there's still amazing amounts of uh, valuable stuff out there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, my, my philosophy is that apart from that it is, you know, manifested or worded in that particular special, unique way by a human, that somehow this wisdom is also there in nature or is there in no sphere. So it's only a matter of getting with that kind of universal wisdom that allows you to, uh, well, wherever you are. with that, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hi, ah, yes. <laughs> All right, we, we got 10 people so far. Oh, 11, I think. Good, good. Good. All right. Yeah, I think we can kick off. Uh, thanks everyone for jumping in. Um, you know, welcome back. Many uh, of the of the faces we haven't seen for, for a while. Super happy to have you guys back. Um, you know, it's September 2nd, kind of indicates the, the beginning of the, the school year, but also I feel it's um, kind of like this this mental re-entry of the world into realization that, hey, the summer is over and COVID is still here. And, you know... Yeah, so, summer was the easy bit in some ways. The, the fact that so many places were out of school, it just put a pause on it. It wasn't a thing that anyone had to worry about for the most part. And now reality is hit back and it's, it's not good. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I prompted this whole kind of like to to ease into the potential, the uh, reactivation of regular daily calls and not just for the purposes of kind of like reporting and very dry reporting, but just like hanging out and, and seeing familiar faces and being human after all. So thanks for, for showing up. Um, basically, I wanted to, to prompt a discussion. How do we think we can best reactivate the regular daily calls or bi-daily calls or or something like that because every time we we started the discussion about um, these kind of like team calls or team demos uh, we didn't really get much movement so i felt like maybe we should just revert to what was working before which is daily calls where we kind of call in everyone who can join uh, depending on the time zone 
and we just fill out um, the document that um, we've kind of tested before, but I've created a spreadsheet version of it just because the, the Google Doc became so big. Huge, absolutely <laughs> huge. It became so long by the end of it. I was like, this is silly. Yeah, I think that was also one of the reasons why no one wanted to actually open it. It was just too big and too slow. So I kind of created uh, this coronavirus progress. I, re I removed daily to remove the extra pressure from the daily routine. But basically, let's, um, let's try to reactivate these daily calls and don't treat it as reporting calls. Basically, whoever can join uh, will join. And I think the habit of kind of pulling out the details from the DMs will be uh, a very good thing for us to, to reactivate. Just because last week we had uh, almost 8,000 messages uh, sent out in our Slack. And it's crazy because you can't really tell. I can, ba I can barely see it. Yeah, there's, some, there's a lot of behind the scenes conversations going on that, yeah. I yeah, mean, I'm still in most. I'm still in a, a large majority of channels, and it doesn't feel that active to me. Yeah, which is not bad, but it definitely um, prevents the the like stumbling of people into things. Like in in April or May, we had this uh, weird phenomenon that someone sends in Google Doc, and then all of a sudden, people jump into it and add stuff, and it just propels it forward. And I think we're, we're actually individually experiencing fatigue from not seeing something like that happening and feeling that, hey, nothing is really happening. But then once a week or once two weeks, uh, you know, someone sends out these giant newsletters with uh, a lot of things um, that happened in them. And it just feels weird because from one hand, you feel like you're missing out right? But on the other hand, you can't really see what you're missing out because it's all in DMs or private channels and all of these places. So um, yeah, I just wanted to, to react, reactivate the uh, these daily calls and see what happens. The, the worst case scenario will have um, not that many people joining in, uh, but I, th I think that will still help for all the other people that will be watching these calls after all. Yeah. What do you guys think? Yeah. Just a simple, simple thought. Uh, one thought I already expressed to you is this one, as well as from organization point of view, as from in nature, by a mimicry point of view, all things that take shape start small. So this one-on-one -on -one interactions or DMs aren't a bad thing. This is where it initiated. Uh, we've got to be some somehow sensitive to at, at, at a certain point where it is matured enough or right enough then to uh, uh, relegate it or, or uh, skip it up to a broader group-wise, team-wise, channel-wise kind of uh, collaboration. So it's, it's, it's a question of balance. So the question might be how, how it sends into the point let's say these initial interactions, ideas, exchange and whatever, uh, should be propagated to, let's say, a platform, a channel, a team, a group, temporary focused group, where it can be enriched by interactions with others. That's how I would word it. Yeah. And I think the, you know, the heuristic that I use when someone DMs me is like, is this really an individual request or something that pertains to me? Or is this something that other people would benefit from if they would see this message in my reply to it? And sometimes I even do weird things and kind of like, um, you know, answer that request and then copy uh, that thing and throw it in, in a public channel just uh, so that people see that there is something happening and there is some knowledge flowing in and out. So that's also something that um, we can uh, utilize on an individual basis. But again, uh, it, it kind of feels weird when you do that. So just be aware of that. Yeah, I mean, for me, for me, um, 
the way I look at it is, is a private conversation, like you, like uh, what I said, that a private conversation is a private conversation, and often private conversations are where new ideas are stemmed from. But I think more people, I'd like to see more people have more confidence to have these private conversations in a public space, in the same sort of sense that if it was an office, it, these two people wouldn't go to a side office and close the door behind them. They would just chat between two desks. That's the way I think of it. And yes, most people are probably not going to join in the conversation, but occasionally there's two people chatting amongst themselves. Somebody at a distance hears something that's interesting and joins in. And that's that sort of organic serendipity that we need to try and still promote because that's where little bits of magic happen or little bits of like, oh, actually I've heard of this because from this place or I actually saw this link the other day from here and maybe you'd find use from it. Even if it's just... Uh, from like someone who's not an expert in one thing, but brings a an odd little tidbit or an odd little idea and brings it into it, or even just challenges some assumptions that are going on, because it's really easy to like make loads of assumptions with somebody you already agree with. But the broader the thought space is, the more rounded an idea often it turns up. And I think if we could build a bit more confidence in communication and have more people feel confident to discuss things in a more open environment, like a chat, a public channel or that sort of space. It's like, the way I look at it is like, I could talk for most things. I feel like I could talk about most things in public channels. There are a few exceptions to that rule. You know, if it's a private matter about something that's personal, fair enough. And if it's um, a sensitive matter that's got some sort of data sensitivity, Fair enough. But other than that, for the most part, I don't see why anyone would feel like they need to hide something. That's my perception. If trust and confidence and hope is uh, of the essence for broadening the conversation to make it more public, the question is, and to all here, and this, this calls for some collective inquiry, what do you feel that might or help yeah. this 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 condition of hope, trust, transparency? Um, I didn't catch. Hi guys, it's been a while. Hi, um, hi. hi. So, um, I didn't quite catch what you what you just said, but I think part of the issue. Um, from at least my personal experience at this moment, coming in from being like MIA for a couple of weeks, um, every now and then I will jump on Slack. And like Arthur said, um, it would seem to me as if nothing is like going on because there's so many different channels and so many things happening. Uh, but a lot of it is happening in like private channels so I'd be like oh nothing is I'm not I'm not missing much but I am missing quite a bit because people are like talking amongst themselves which isn't necessarily a bad thing but I think part of the issue is that there's so many different channels that sometimes people don't really know which channel to start a conversation and and it's easier if they just know so and so might be like a good point of contact on this or what um great point so yeah 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 so i think new channels get created out of like all sorts of different ideas um and in the moment it seems like the best thing or it seems uh like a good idea but then in in hindsight or at least now it just seems like it's rather overwhelming and not uh like not really contributing to like effective way of communicating. Yeah, and that's a great point that you're bringing up that um, essentially the, the channels feel depersonalized, right? And you can't really tell who's, who's really, um, you know, responsible for it, which I think we can help with um, continuous filling out of these kind of, uh, let's say, documentations about our organization. And we can even uh, showcase these channels on the like on the homepage or something for people to better understand where they should be going 
in the way as we did that in the very first um, months of Corona Y, if anyone remembers, we had this um, we had this diagram where people would would see it and see where they should be going. And I think that worked pretty well, the visual guide to Corona Y. Um, yeah, this one. And I think we need an updated version of this because some of these things are, are not even- Some of them, <laughs> some <laughs> of them. I don't think any of them are a thing anymore, basically. Well, task VT is, is still a thing, right? Um, is, it, is it really? Does it still function like that? I don't know. The channel? That's a good question because, yeah, a majority of the sub teams moved into private channels, I think. Yeah, they've gone into little spaces on their own, haven't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe let's, uh, Tyler, if you can help me um, to recreate the, the updated version of this, I think that would be huge. Uh, we can just use Miro you know, or any other. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll... yeah, and especially on Sorry the... Sorry for killing the dream, Matan. <laughs> what? He's just in chat. He's because he's talked about auto extracting um, direct messages and posting them to a channel. And um, direct messages and private messages are private from everyone, including the admin, because they are <laughs> by design private. Because some a lot of companies don't want to have totalitarian level control where they can read every single conversation because it kind of, it does stifle and, it, and companies don't want to stifle their yeah. employees in, in that sort of way. From my understanding, it, um, I don't think this is necessarily uh, bringing up that private conversations are a bad thing or shouldn't happen. I think they, I'm not sure who mentioned it, but I think usually private conversations are where like ideas um, get started. The issue is just having that confidence in like knowing where uh, where to carry it to carry it forward um, in the public channel. So people can still have private conversations. I don't think it's. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's not about it's not about banning private conversation because, like I said, there is a there's a time and a place for it. You know, if someone's got a a complaint to make or they've got an issue they want to talk to one person about, like there's there's a thousand good reasons to have a private conversation. We just need to have work out how to make people more confident to have public conversations about an inquiry that they have, a thought they've had. I've got this concept and let me just spit it out there and put it somewhere so more than one person could see it. Because yeah, they've got one person who might be a really good, they, you know, I, I, for me, if I, if, there was a, that, that, if I had an idea and I wanted Anton and Arta to know about it, I could make a new mini chat between three of us and talk about it. Or I could start it somewhere in a more public space and just tag them in it and go, these are, I know these two people would be the most interested in it, but if anyone else has got anything to put into it, I'm happy yeah. to hear it too. The problem is that- And I think it's having that and working out where to put something like that yeah. and not having a million billion channels with a million billion, because it just gets, I mean, mine's- I think I there, added is, into channels there are a couple of things here. <laughs> Obviously the, the problem of finding the right place to post, it takes mental energy when you have like hundred channels. Uh, right. So we need to simplify that. And the second one, um, people still fear public uh, perception, right? Um, you yeah. don't want to post something and look stupid. You and don't want to look stupid. You don't want to look like you've said something that somebody else has said and you've not known about it. There's, there's loads of social pressures. That's yeah, and one of the reasons we, why it's about confidence I've described it as. It actually works in a kind of like, once you have the momentum of people doing it uh, a lot, that fear disappears. But once you cross the you know, threshold when nothing is happening publicly, like you just can't get out of, of that. Um, so I think this is what we're currently experiencing. So, I mean, gradually, I think we can try to, to establish a habit of that uh, and see if we can cross the threshold because right now... If I, if I may add something, uh, Arthur. Go ahead. First of all, hello, everybody. It's been, uh, I've been away for a, it's been a good, while. Uh, two or three weeks. It's, I think the problem is pretty much the opposite. It's that uh, on the public channels, uh, at any given time, 
two or three topics are being discussed uh, in parallel. So a newcomer or someone that has been uh, away for a while like me is getting lost. You, you cannot uh, find the point of entry to the system through the public through the public channels because it feels like you will interrupt something or, or what you say will be lost between other matters that have more momentum. I don't know if I'm expressing it correctly, if you understand what no, I'm no, saying. No, no, I, I could, yeah, I completely, which is why it's a balancing act of having the right place to say it and working out how to have a space to have these exploratory conversations that once they've explored past a certain threshold can have a, a different conversation that can be more focused. I mean, that goes back to the idea for me that when a conversation should be happening, people should try and keep it in the thread because then you end up with the But you cannot, you cannot enforce that. I don't think you have this. I know, um, I know. I know you can't. Th this would be ideal because you would keep threaded conversations and... It, uh, it almost looked like a forum then, an old school yeah. forum where there's the beginning of the thread and the conversation about that conversation and then you would end, that way you'd end up with a channel with well, you could, starts you could split it. You could split it at some point if it deviates a, a lot. Yeah. What would do you need, Yason, uh, if, if you being absent then for some weeks uh, or maybe even some days, what, what do you need to to jump in, to be encouraged, to, let's say, focus on where you can contribute to, or you can, you know, uh, put in some, some new ideas. What is it that then, that would enable you to... The best, uh, the best case would be uh, something like a curated the summary of everything, like a single, at a single point, as Arthur said. Maybe... Okay. I don't know if this can be, if, if it's easy to construct, maybe the document uh, would just show. If it was well populated, I would hop in and check what, what's been happening for the past uh, yeah. two weeks. Okay, okay. So okay. now so if I go through the Slack channels, I'm totally lost. And I was pretty oh, familiar with almost everything and I got lost. Yeah, it, gets, lost. it gets pretty overwhelming. I mean, I've kind of been a lot less active. I've been sort of more passive. And it's the same sort of thing. There's times when I'm like, I'm not involved in this conversation and I have no idea what's being discussed mm. or I just don't even understand it because it's gone past something I've even paid attention to. Anyway, someone was going to say I something. There, yeah, I think if there's a way to make the document um, where everything is, <clears throat> excuse me, where um, all of the progress is being updated, to sync that or make that... Um, I don't know if there's a way to up, to get that updated as well as the um, the, the graph um, that you you showed Arthur, where it shows like who to go to or where to go to for um, certain whatever information you need. I think a good start is to update those two. That way, if you've been whether you've been like MIA for a few weeks or you haven't, but you just need to know like who exactly is working on so and so, you know exactly where to go and which if we can figure out a way to like make that correspond to yeah. uh, really to Good. the different like actual channels or what. So it's not, it's less overwhelming. It's more direct. Okay, I'm getting back after like a month and I want to know what's happening in this team. And I can just look on the, like on the map thing and know, okay, I can just go onto this channel and like, I don't know, search this conversation or what. I yeah. think there's a way to do that. Um, Clear. Yeah. Clear. So a graph being a map and a document. What that we've already uh, had. Yeah, just yeah. what we uh, exactly. uh, need to update it and, and alongside the map, a document that says, okay, these are the positions of the various teams, projects, focus groups, where they are, what, on what the issues now are at hand. So, makes that, sense. That makes sense. And it, it also touches on the, the actual onboarding process. So, um, we had Shivangani, she's here on the call, um, actually help us with the onboarding of new people. 
um, for the past week. And we, we actually established this internal habit of, of creating a list of, of people that joined and uh, kind of having statuses to better understand if, uh, if they activated, if there was uh, someone having an onboarding call with them. So um, for example, for last week, um, I took some of the onboarding calls and some uh, were taken by Shimangani. And I think this is also something, this flow chart should be provided to these people before the call. So they have a better mental map of like the landscape uh, so that when we're onboarding them, we actually can you know, present a more educated choice to them. This is where you know, NLP things uh, happening. This is where computer vision things happening. And based on their skill sets, we can better match them to be onboarded and increase the chances of them actually activating. Because, you know, most frequently when people join Corona Y, they're already motivated. If they filled out the form, they definitely want to contribute. And it's, it's just a mismatch of us um, kind of like guiding them either into the wrong direction where they don't have ability to contribute or there is a giant task that we're pushing onto them that is obviously not fit to the, the regular volunteering activity. But as long as we have this flow chart and let's try to, to have it done by the end of the week um, and test it on the new incoming uh, people because that, that would be the best, uh, the, the fastest indicator if this flow chart works. If we can increase the number of people that onboard and activate and start contributing. Yeah, guys mm -hmm. are saying a couple of interesting things in chat. Um, videos, yeah, video proofs. Yeah, video is a slow method of information. It's a very dense way of having a lot of information, but it's um, it's not the most efficient way. You can't scan a video very easily. A document is normally the easiest way to scan it. But I, admittedly, I think onboarding with a video is a very effective way of being having a personable connection and building that actual human relationship, or at least starting the human connection relationship within the community. So I do think like onboarding, because I've seen a couple of uh, Shivagani's um, yeah. onboarding um, calls. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Shivangani. Yeah, first of all, I want to add something to the point, you know, as it's discussed just now that, you know, if somebody is out of the track for maybe just a month or something like that, and, you know, they want to continue with the thing. So it will be quite messy if they go by, you know, all the chats and, you know, try to find out which thing is relevant for them. So, you know, to ease it out, uh, I think we can maintain a, a, a specific folder or a sheet where, you know, uh, maybe I can create it in such a fashion that uh, whatever is relevant information, uh, particularly discussed in a specific team. Uh, so that entry wise, it will be restricted means uh, it should be open to all means all the topics are not relevant to everyone, right? So the most important things are uh, kept as restricted to certain members and you know the things which are uh, which should be in a public domain kind of thing so it will be open for all so that way you know people can get a hold that okay fine uh, this thing has happened in uh, 15 days or maybe 20 days time so they can get a track of it easily without you know, uh, any waste of time so maybe we actually extend this current uh, daily uh, progress sheet was the folder yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so that we can actually have a folder of resources and documents that people can uh, look through. And let's assume that each, each team will have a folder on our share, shared Google Drive. And we, we can basically try to have the team leads manage that folder because that is also a challenge. Some documents get outdated very quickly. I think now we're at the stage where documents uh, get outdated, not as quick as in April, May, but they still will. Um, and I think a, a nice addition, or maybe this folder actually can be a Notion page. Um, I know that Anton started using Notion as, um, as a way to kind of organize all the data. Um, so we've done Notion for, for example, for pulmonary, um, pulmonary fibrosis team. And can you guys see my screen? Yeah. yeah. 
So yes. this is kind of a, a quick way to organize things and uh, a central place for people that are interested in this team and would like to get deeper into it because uh, the first decision that person has to make whether this team is is relevant to him if he wants to to contribute to it and this is when um, I think we can utilize website pages so for example for, for this people can just go through through these and understand if this is relevant to them computer vision um, pulmonary disease lungs um, team and they can see okay this is relevant to me i want to participate in it then they go into a folder or notion um, maybe we can call it like a um i don't know resource center something and this is where they stumble upon uh upon the the list of all the things be it data sets or models or any kind of video calls that the team had previously let me just add that you, you still need to to take care to organize the the notion in a in a timeline fashion because many many discussions start and uh, don't uh, get followed up so it it will quickly fill up yeah i think you need uh, some kind of uh, of timeline to yeah. know well, what's actually, the current activity in, in notion there is a really like Initially, it was designed to be like this log of notes. So in a sense, all of those ideas you saw that we did before regarding like journal of what's happening, the templates of report, etc. I was actually start looking into like, and looks like Notion has a lot of like this uh, building blocks for us to build that type of a log system. Because it just essentially, it's the question of creating a template and then there is a section on the notion page that you know if somebody like created some piece of contribution they click new then there is like that table that you proposed maybe we'll you know adjust it a little bit people fill it out boom it's done and now we have a log with a like timestamp you know what was done etc etc oh, maybe after good. every if it's, conversation if it's time stamped, uh, if it, i i didn't uh... I didn't understand it had the timestamp, so I saw it as a... Well, right now, what we have is, a, like, we only used for a team for pulmonary fibrosis, only, like, the basic blocks, because we were mm -hmm. testing it in terms of embedding that as a web page. And from Notion, right now, you, you need to, like, export it, etc. So, anyways, we just use the blocks of toggling, like, uh, links, embedded links, etc. But Notion has much more other building blocks we we'll probably need to schedule a, a different call to to discuss it uh in the vertical of that journal and we will definitely like re-engage that that thought process of creating this proper trace of contributions okay. and martin is suggesting to have a follow-up in uh, in the form of a by power user or somebody who's most experienced up till now with it yeah. am I, I think that's a good suggestion yeah and i actually agree Depends. with tyler that i don't think we have a power user uh, and it also based on the assumption that um it's going to be a long-term solution i mean we still need to talk about the fact that if slack's going to be a long-term yeah. solution or, or if we're going to move off of that and how we're going to move off of slack if we are going to because there's a lot of data so uh, in slack a few thoughts regarding uh, Notion power users. Uh, remember, Tyler, we already tried to, to do this, and at that time, it was like, kind of like, okay, who's going to use it, blah, blah, blah. So uh, why I, like, right now has this push for Notion is because uh, Fibrosis team, in a sense, uh, like, they started first using it. I'm like, oh, okay, I have a team account. Let's, let's try to do this. And then after that, uh, from other teams as well. They were like, so here and there we have people who are like, oh, I'm using Notion as well, you know, for my personal needs, etc. That's why this current push, and I think eventually we'll get somebody who is like crazy into Notion in terms of organizing their lifestyle around this as a note-taking uh, app. Um, 
uh, what was the other piece we just mentioned? I had another thought to share. So moving off Slack might be oh, moving. because the, the best thing I think that exists in Slack is actually ability to quickly connect with organizations through the shared yes. channels. And this yeah, is it's a really, really well used system and it does integrate other, other workspaces super easily. Yeah. Annoyingly like, easily. You know, addiction that you can get off uh, Slack because of that. And because if we lose that ability, and this is what happens if we move into free version of Slack, we have to revert to emails and that's going to be you know, less than ideal, especially when working with big organizations or organizations where there are more than five people and email is just not, uh, you know, suited to. Yeah. to and the worst part is that monetization of Slack is not tied to, let's say, how, for example, like for us, the value is definitely this bridging channels, but then you pay for Slack, not by based on how many bridging channels you've got, but how many active members active on users, your Slack you which, have and which and, careers and for us it's 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 a disaster because right like okay we we probably will scale this bridging channels you know, I will they will grow and probably grow linear but ideally we would like to see in our community to kind of explode exponentially when we get sorted out all of this onboarding processes right how we scale the projects and then your bill for Slack explodes exponentially as well without getting this linear only added value. So that will be you know, a hard part. And uh, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's something that I've been mindful of is, is Slack is very good at being very good at what it does. But the side effect of that is, is it's obviously a very profitable company because it's very smart at what yeah. it does too. And, it's the, and it does have the advantage of network effects. I mean, by, like you said, the ability to network with other networks is one of the things that's useful about it. And we don't definitely don't want to go to like email between networks. But the problem is as well, if we did move into the more open source space, I mean, part of the reason why so many people use Slack is because it's easy to use. If we could work out how, you know, and have enough people who are good with Matrix or something of its ilk, and then we reach out to other, comp you know, other organizations and other groups. Oh, we're, we're running on a Slack, blah, blah, blah. We've got the, you know, the, the month temporary free thing or whatever they're running on. And then we could then go, well, we used to use that. Now we use this. If you would like some advice how to build your own, we will give you that advice because we had to move off of it because it wasn't sustainable to our organization and movement at scale. And if it's an organization or a movement similar to us, trying to do similar things, maybe at a scale, maybe not, um, either they'll realize that they've got the same problem in the future and they might just preemptively start planning the migration into one open source mm -hmm. space, or because of the nature of Matrix and its open source space, we might be able to just make space for them on our system and go, oh, you can have that on your thing. And, it, well, and then we start to go from being one connection in a, in a set of nodes to being one of the host nodes that builds everyone else's connections. And we stop being going from having to rely on Slack to do it to relying on our own infrastructure abilities and our, our own ability to connect things. And we also grow the open source space within that with positivity. And we stop making people so reliant yeah, on Slack. Because Slack's amazing, but... This is a mission in itself. It's like Corona wife for COVID-19. This should be like on op for open science. This, the, the, this is a mission in itself. But I, I definitely agree with, like, with this direction. Uh, since we, we kind of played with matrix protocol, etc., and it looks like there are all of these integrations, right, between like you can do your matrix chat and have a bot connected and replicate the messages on Slack channels somewhere mm -hmm. there. But like, so technically it's kind of doable to build those bridge channels between like, you know, Slack and out of Slack chat rooms or whatever. But so far I haven't seen any examples of it actually working as it's supposed to be like this, easy to use it. I'm like, okay, I want to channel 
so I'm 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 a external organization, let's say, right? I'm 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 doing something like a startup that that wants to do pattern recognition and text, yada yada, and now we're building a Slack connection with with current coronavirus Slack organization. Like there is no easy way for me just to simply hook up to the channel and now I'm posting on my you know chat room and I'm seeing the reply messages from let's say Arthur jumping in on the channel. Everything I saw is just kind of like stupid bot goes from one chat room and just you know copy and paste message. So it, it's I haven't seen implementation of that actually working. So if somebody ever experienced and saw how it was done properly, that will be a great help for us to figure out the solution. Two things. We can put uh, the, this issue as a question or a call, maybe to a wider community yeah, to share the problem, mm -hmm. share the issue, maybe to, to get to know about solutions out there that we don't know of. Maybe this, for instance, this Joggle platform, um, who we, we talked to, uh, Anton, was mm -hmm. yesterday. Yeah. That is such a platform kinds of communities, initiatives are working. This might be an issue there, just to see if, if uh, share it and to, to see if there's resonance or maybe even solutions uh, to the problem okay. or to get traction, to create community. Indeed, it's a program on itself uh, to establish something in collaboration. Yeah, I, I, I like this idea, what you like. So let's, we definitely need to uh, outsource this problem a little bit, part of it, to other <laughs> communities as well. Because, right, it's not our, it's not only our issue with uh, paying for Slack just to maintain the bridge channels, right? We need to disperse this solution to all of them as well. And then collaboratively, maybe there will be something out of there. Because if we're all doing this disjointly, Slack got us. That's the whole deal. Slack got us from this end. Like if we were all yeah. alone, Which is why I said to solve it. this. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, but nonetheless, so it, it takes convergence of holders, so to speak, somehow, collaboration. But th then there may still be the need, given the fact that it, it, it takes time, energy, and resources to get there. You need an intermediate solution where there's a need, I think, within 30 days or something, I have to point that out. To, to come up with some solution, two things. Uh, this intermediate solution, the cost of Slack now, is that completely or by and large depending on the number of members? It's, it's the members. number of active members within a month. Uh, let me have a quick look at how much it would be for this month because it's probably going to make my eyes water. It's 172 members. Uh, one thousand one hundred and twenty-eight dollars is due on the seventeenth of the ninth for one month. Yeah, but it, it, the, the cost. One hundred and forty-one active members. One hundred and forty-one active members as of right now, in the last um, thirty days. As a whole. I, actually, where where do you see that? Because I see one hundred seventy-two. They come well, with a bill. Active. It's weekly. It's based uh, on weekly activity. So here. So it depends on active members? Active members. Okay. And active members are readers and typers. If they've logged right. in, man, if you if you go to the, the Slack and you go to Corona Y at the top and then right at the top. Okay. Click on Corona Y and then you just go right to the top. Right, right, right to the top. Click on the Corona Y bit and I've got a little standard chart standard trial tab on mine it says oh. our payment details hmm. i'll show you if you want to watch yeah I'll see it right now. Okay. I can't well, then, as, as a non-profit we could get like a 70 percent off or something so it could definitely cut a bill a little bit but it's still not, it's still 300 dollars uh, a month yes. even if it and that's 300 dollars based on 100, 140 active members and if we get 140 active members and they start doing something really well and we get 300, that's $600 a month. That yeah. just, yeah. and like you said, it scales exponentially based on the amount of people in there. The bloody thing is that we're working on a future where Slack and employees and their family 
uh, uh, will profit from anyway. <laughs> yes. Well, pretty yes. much. I, I see the solution is like this. Maybe like stupid bot like keeps uh, like having all of this uh, bridge channel on Slack. It's the only active member, like five bucks a month, right? And then we, we move to some other platform. And that yeah. bot is just doing like this. Uh, it's doing forth. all the ferry. It's all the ferry. I mean, that's one thing that I was thinking of is like, if we could just get a bot that to do it and we could host everything off site on open source stuff for free, yeah, yeah. where we could have everyone. But, but yeah, there's a conversation bot that we have, like, we still keep the Corona Y slack as it is right now. If yeah. just no one active on it because a bot would be anything managing it all. Yeah. That's a, oh, that's and we kept the all bridges. of the history. And we have all of and the yeah, history keep kept on Slack because that's another big piece, right? We can Searching export model. a lot of that. Public channels can be exported and documented. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Private channels can't be. Not can't a bad idea. It. Definitely need to think about that one. Um, okay. And I would like to bring uh, this discussion that uh, Matan, Tyler, and me are having in, in chat regarding the, the streaming and kind of like yeah. creating this open... Uh, open office um, in a video format where people can just jump on calls and start working on some things or problems because I feel like we actually want that coming from a traditional workspace. Um, we don't necessarily want that for eight hours per day, but we want um, at least an hour a day or something to jump and, and collaborate and work on some things. And we've used to have these in, a f in some form and I think even if I would be like creating a newsletter, I'm pretty sure you guys would be interested, like jumping in, adding to it, or like uh, filling in things that I may be missing out from from the you know important perspectives. So um, I think we we need to find uh, some way. And I'm I'm really you know stupid in streaming streaming technologies, but uh, Tyler, we defer to you to to suggest what we should do. Um, for, for me, um, well, I was, I was literally in a, a call, a, a Zoom call recently, and the Zoom call had Facebook integrated that streamed it live. No idea how it was done. Um, so there is a possibility of using Zoom as the host and have Zoom send out on our behalf so one person isn't the, um, the streamer. Um, or we use something, or we use something like uh, Discord, and someone is the streamer. Someone actually actively captures it and streams it manually. So um, I think there is a solution um, to use Restream, which is the so the we'd platform. probably want we'd probably want YouTube Live really. Restream, yeah, Restream's a free service. Yeah, uh, they're actually from my hometown in in Ukraine. So I, I have good connections with them, so we can. Ask. Yeah, I know, I know, I know a few streamers that use Restream to stream on like YouTube and Facebook and Twitch at the same time, or when Mixer existed, Mixer, but Mixer don't exist anymore. Okay, uh, Tyler, would you be able to help with with this part? Uh, I'm gonna send this link. Yes, I mean, like I said, I know I know how to stream. My computer can do it. It's not that I. It's, probably, it's not the problem with like my computer being set up and knowing how to do it. It's the um, it's going to be centralized unless we can work out a way that you can basically have a cloud call that is automatically streamed when there's enough people in it or when somebody goes, okay, well, there's five of us here chatting, let's just stream. Or if it's a case of we have it, I mean, the way I look at it, it we need to kind of think of it as like um, a community thing. So if people are just hanging out chatting, you know, and it could be just voice only, not, not, you know, it could be just a voice only call. Discord would be perfect for something like that. And Discord has video functionality because I do my D&D &D &D games through it. Yeah. And you can Look, do it I think just we fine. can do it with the, the actual paid Zoom account that we have because um, uh, they have the streaming URL and we can basically yeah, plug them in. We could probably put it into, if that was the case, we could probably set it up to stream to YouTube which would be the most sensible place to stream it because we have a YouTube and that's the most obvious place to try and populate. So people could pop into YouTube or the YouTube, or the YouTube live. Okay. They're on live right now. I w and you know, I will actually go join the call because of I'm interested in what they're discussing or. Quick question. Quick question. Like how discord is getting monetized. 
when I was reading, like they have like this tokens, yada yada. So there's like, tokens and Nitro and a few other monetization systems, but it is all nearly all of it's optional. Um, a well, Nitro, if they, if a site's uh, if a, a, a channel's got a lot of Nitro, basically it affects things like Kodak, which is like audio Kodak quality. Like it, lots and lots of they'll get a boosted audio Kodak quality, which will improve it to the point where you could even so, listen to music over it. You can so it's, just it's what is like Nitro? That. Is it like I'm buying something as a user and then I it's, donate you can Nitro? Boost, yeah, the... yeah you, can, you can donate it to a channel, yeah. You, like, um, there's quite a few streamers who have like super premium Discord channels and mm -hmm. as a way of making the Discord server better, like the members can boost it by paying the five dollars a month or three dollars a month or whatever, and it, and collectively they all make the server itself better. Um, there's loads of bot integration systems in Discord as well. There's bot management systems. There's straight auto streaming stuff connected to it. Like it's a really really big in the streaming community. Of Discord. It's become I think that's, that like feels the de facto like a system. Yeah, Discord's like the de facto system for community management on in gaming communities and creative communities it's like because it's it's, it's cloud-based in the sense that you know what i used to use teamspeak years ago on ventrilo and they were always like private instances of voice com channels and you have to set them up and you have to have like keys and you have to have administrators and you obviously still have administrators in discord but all of it is in the cloud it's on some you know it's on a it's on discord servers and the side effect of that is is like you get local latency rather than um, regional mm. latency so if, if i mean if like I, you can regionalize them like i'm on a lot of american servers and i get the re the the server lag of being in europe compared to being in america but the server lag is so small it's not really a thing that's a it's a problem um but yeah it's this it's things like that it's like i said I, I game and hang out with streamers i've been doing it a lot less recently but um but yeah there's definitely a place for it and like you say you can have video calls Without with basically one button, you can turn a call into a video call, um, and you can have and there's lot and you can have as many channels and as many you can have chat channels, and video channels and moderated systems and bots and there's like it's one of them things that like once the gaming community gets out of something, they can morph it and turn it into everything they want. So there's yeah. loads and loads of systems out there that could improve it. It's not. I don't know if it's necessarily a full replacement to Slack, but it is, it's a gaming lean, but there's still plenty of functionality. Well, what is interesting is actually monetization scheme because for us, right, this community, like essentially gathering donations for services where there's tokens, you know, it just kind of also can make sense because on our Slack, it is sense. if Slack had similar type of, uh, billing yeah, if, 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 exactly. If everyone could just chip in a fiver. Yeah. And, well, I mean, and, one and thing it, is yeah. chip in a fiver, but let's say I'm jumping in on Slack and I'm doing like three, three messages. I don't want to pay five bucks for that, right? Oh. But if if you look at our members who are like doing like thousands of messages, somebody like who is less, etc., you can kind of see that different people extract different value from the chat, and and different people have different like abilities to contribute five bucks for somebody who is in like uh, America or Europe, it's probably not a big deal. But if, if you're from some other parts of the world, it, it shouldn't be a five bucks. It should be like, yeah, $1. it's it, it definitely, I'm definitely like uh, pay. I think a pay as you feel kind of model would be work, would work, but at the same time, that's not only expecting people to turn up and do work, but it's also expecting people to pay to do work, which is kind of counterintuitive to make anyone want to pay to do work or well, even yeah, pay that, to that, That's why tokens like all of this Nitro, yada, yada, whatever uh, Discord is doing, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, because it's the, it's a way of monetizing, but in a, it's a, it, it's a freemium model in the sense that everything works for free. There is no limitations. Having these features, uh, nice to have, not, you lose, I mean, what, do you know what happens when our, when, when the Corona Y lo loses it, when it loses its um, premium status, you know what's going to happen? I know what's going to happen. Anybody have an idea how bad we're going to get neutered when it happens? You mean on Slack? <laughs> yeah, on Slack, when Slack yeah, goes like to 10, premium. Yeah, like 10,000 messages 10, history. It's like we do that. We week. do that in a month. 
we we do that in a month. Not not a lot of. I think it's like a week or two. Yeah. So <laughs> we are gonna we're gonna like we're gonna lose institutional memory overnight, and we're gonna lose. Oh well, actually, I remember searching for that. I was talking about it in March with you know, someone. I was talking about this thing and it was there and it was like, oh, actually, I'll go search it up. Oh yeah, that was some really interesting links. And he was like, I'm part of a couple of slacks and they're free. And yeah, if, if it's past a, past a couple of months, some of the channels are just like, yep, you can't see this anymore. You have to pay. Yeah. And I'm just like, that is not, a f that's a shitty feature. I understand why Slack does it because obviously they want to perpetuate the idea that people are going to monetize it and you don't want to lose that. But you get mad. <laughs> Yeah, it's just it's it's just it's it's yeah. it's a feature to frustrate, and it's designed to frustrate because for then people will pay to re remove the frustration. In a gaming yeah. world, it's it, in the gaming sort of terminology, it's a microtransaction, but it's not a microtransaction because you want a cool skin. It's a microtransaction of why you lose a leg, and you're like. Mm, I don't really have an option on that. I feel like I need my leg to play the game proper. I can hop around, but I'm still losing a leg and I need it. <laughs> and that's kind yeah. of the mentality they've got to it. And, it. and obviously it works because they're getting paid very well. But I'm just, I'm just mindful of the fact that I don't, want a, I don't want an organization to have thousands of dollars a month in bills for a system that is absolutely costing money to run, but... It's just um, not that complicated an idea. I mean, like, MIRC servers have been around since the 90s, and this is just a snazzy version of, version of MIRC. I mean, like, if we really need to, we could definitely just throw up MIRC servers and, and integrate, because Discord is just MIRC with a screen... With a, it literally integrates with old IRC servers. It works in the same principle, same as a Twitch chat is just IRC. And I wouldn't be surprised if Slack is basically a skin of IRC. Like the technology has not gone that far in 30 years. And it probably will because it's just text communication. <laughs> it's really not that complicated. So uh, I'm, just, I'm just kind of like aggrieved with the price point they decide on based on like how many active users you have. It's just a really weird way of working. I don't want to cut you off, Tyler, but bef before, you, before you know, <laughs> just be before you get all your frustration poured out and um, a workshop on all the various tools that are out there, doesn't that make sense? Point of order that if we restart these daily calls, uh, that we also try to practice, practice, let's say, uh, catching uh, topics, issues to work on in these de general daily calls and then separate them to you know a smaller focus group working on that wasn't that partly the idea uh, um, a tour as well you know uh, to say okay this this makes sense hot this is this gets traction let's separate it have a follow-up on this topic with a smaller group working on it, having focus on it, and then move on to something that is also more general. Or is this a bad intervention of me? <laughs> uh, actually, so as you guys are seeing, I'm, I'm trying to fill out the, yeah, yeah. the progress document. And no, actually, I, let's quickly go through it because um, obviously we don't have everyone here on, on the call. But maybe uh, people uh, that are here, um, do we have Critty still? Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, we have Critty. Oh, oh, she's there. I can't see I have everyone. to jump off. Um, I will catch up on the recording. But just to jump back on the um, Slack issue, or commun internal communication issue, I think that sounds like it deserves a call on its own just yeah. to figure out like what yeah. where that needs to um, come up with the, come up with the plan of how to move forward with that um, but yeah it was good, good catching up um, I will tune in on the recording for the rest of this conversation but I've got to I've got to get running for for the, for the night
Sounds good. Okay, okay. It's really nice to hear from you, Argali. It's nice to hear your voice again. It's nice to hear all of you, to be honest. It's been a pretty lonely last couple of months for myself. <laughs> yeah, I agree. All right, well, take care, guys. Bye -bye. Um, I assume, um, well, I will figure out whether this is happening daily or bi biweekly or... Um, yeah, by the end of the call, we'll we'll figure out the the schedule. This is what I mean. Right. It says by the end of the call, the call is going to be probably three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> we will eventually all work out something if we don't die in the process. Well, Very good fun. luck. <laughs> yeah. All right. Bye bye. Probably. All right. Bye bye. Good night, guys. I just opened right. the, the comments and uh, going through. Um, okay, so question from Alex on open source alternatives. There are plenty. They just, you know, they're missing crucial, you know, uh, pieces that we definitely need, like threads or uh, shared channels and other pieces. Um, then, yeah, I, Matan says that we need to get literature review tool monetized. I agree. I mean, if we had some, yeah, problem. yeah, that just let's just let's just make something make money. I mean, that's obviously like sheer Ooh. force of will is how it works. I don't know, Alex. So, uh, just another question on that, Arthur. Um, so, do we? I assume that means that we do not have a place yet that that indicates, you know. Uh, here's an alternative tool. This is what it's missing. This is what's good, or something like that. Some. Anton, have we created such a list or something? I. I, I was. I was actually just when Alex jumped in. I was thinking like, man, we we need a comparative table for all yeah, yeah. Actually, and actually have a I mean, voting I've, system. I've to... pro I've probably got several links on this sort of research from five months ago yeah. when I <laughs> spent great. an inordinate yeah. amount of my time thinking about these problems. But I'll, I'll see what, what I can do. Tyler, like, let's, let's take those like nodes, leaks, whatever you've got, uh, and create, again, we need some form of a, like a table and we need to actually identify which features are actually important on Slack. Mm -hmm. For example, for me personally, I really rely on the reminder feature. Remind yeah. me about this message in three hours because I don't have time to, you know, kind of re reply immediately. I can't just have, I'm kind of person, I hate to have unread messages. So I'm just simply like, okay, I saw somebody ask me to do something like remind me in three hours. Boom. And I should probably use that more. I have started to realize yeah. with discussing these no. sort of things that I am notoriously, I get rid of notifications really fast, but then like a day later, I'm like, yeah, like I'm sure what, there, was, what, what was there, was, there? there was something in the back of my head that I think I yeah. need to do and I can no longer remember it. But and to, and to go thing. searching for it is a massive work. It, it's a useful feature, but it's useful, for example, for me. For you, it's not yet useful, right? So you're not relying on Slack for it. So it's easier for you to migrate. For me, I will be like, no, no, guys, we need to keep Slack going because, you know, micro all depends on it. So we need to figure it out as a, uh, active members who are actually like those who create this bill, right? So like what we actually <laughs> use and then yeah. figuring out like, okay, what is worth? And maybe at the end of the day, we will see that, you know what? All of those features are like important. And those people who, you know, rely on, on, on like to work on them, Maybe it's worse to chip in than like let's let's just pay, right? Like and and so on. Uh, so uh, yeah, let's let's take your your notes, create the list of those tools, and then just kind of collaboratively, uh, everybody creates a column of feature that is not there yet, right? And then let's say yeah. reminders. That's a no, metric. Not. Threads. That's a matrix of of needs derived from our use and our experience with Slack. Yeah. And maybe yeah. some other tools as well with, let's say, uh, uh, comparative tools. Yes. Wh which Based, tools? Uh, vote, which tools? Vote on, yeah. ra ra rate, vote on the, the, the features uh, themselves absolutely need or nice to have. Mm -hmm. And then compare it to the alternatives that are out there also in terms of, of costs. Yeah. Uh, I, I think at some point... Oh, sorry. Keep going. With Oh, I, I was just going to say, I think, you know, um, the, dis the discussion is great. And maybe at some point we may have to realize that, uh, you know, if we're looking for something free, it's probably not going to be perfect. Uh, so we're going to have to give something up. And so a, a methodological way of, of determining what to give up is, 
going to be super helpful. Yeah, it's, it goes back to anything. You can you can either have it fast, really good, yeah. or cheap, but you've got to pick two. And if we want free, then we're going to have to start looking for slightly less convenient models or slightly less, less shiny systems. Or if we want shiny and fully functional, we're going to have to accept that there's going to be some financial element to it. Yeah, it's just you can't you can't have the best tool and the most functional and the most easy to Don't use and mean. free. Uh, well, <laughs> it's just like again, uh, the not free part comes from the fact that you need to host all of the messages, maintain it, etc. So in yeah. a sense, we could ha take that like hosting piece on on our shoulders since we have funds there, right? So in a sense, we definitely could have find a much more like affordable solution compared to Slack because Slack is telling us like, oh no, we will host everything for you. We'll do all, everything for you. Everything is covered. And it, here is the price tag for it. Here's your bill. Here's right. your bill for it, what, yeah. what we could do is just saying like, can we host like it's on our own and just, you know, maybe pay some licensing fees or something, but Slack doesn't provide it. So we need, we're looking for alternative solution that acts in a similar manner. Something. Yeah, ideally a private Slack would be the answer, which has got a next to no fees on it. That if we could just exactly. host it on the, exactly. if we could host a Slack server on the infrastructure that connects into their integrated system, that would be the the ideal. And then if we pay like a fiftieth of the bill <laughs> for licensing fees, that would be like the ideal because we're already getting support when infrastructure costs through you know donations and support through organizations. I mean, I'm worried that at some point that's going to run out too. So we need to kind of, you know, don't make a different bill for us later on. You know, don't kick the can down the at road to find time, out that the we. Editor yeah, you should be monetized. Yeah. Uh, all right, guys. I think we're we're over an hour now, and people start to jump off. I think this was a, a great discussion. I attempted to start filling out the the progress document. I'll share it in the Slack channel. Hopefully, more people will fill it out asynchronously. And let's reconnect tomorrow, same time, and see if you know this this schedule of daily calls um, will work work out. And hopefully we'll, we'll get more people uh, and I'll notify people like Isaac, uh, Sergey, and others to jump in and fill out the, the current progress. And we'll have a more productive discussion on the, the actual team side of things. Uh, meanwhile, let's think about Slack stuff uh, and organize a separate call just to, to talk about that. Sounds like a plan? Yes. Sounds like a plan. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, it was really great to reconnect and see uh, the familiar faces. Nice yeah. to see everybody again. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.